the only way for you to find out how you can help them is by asking them. Hey there, this is Neil Napier from My First Thousand, and today I'm joined by Kay Fabella. Now, Kay is a storyteller. I've got a little bit of description about her hair, her bio, so I'll tell you who exactly Kay is. So, Kay is a storyteller, she's a wordsmith and brand strategist, and she helps businesses that want to pivot. She helps people who want to pivot their business in the right direction, helping entrepreneurs essentially leveling up their business by upgrading their story. Her passion is helping business owners share their message to connect with more of the people that they were meant to serve with their stories and to position themselves as the go-getter in their space. Now, she is a Los Angeles native, so don't hold that against her. And she's based in Madrid right now, Spain, which is a good thing. And she helps solopreneurs to Fortune 500 companies find, tell, and share their stories to boost their bottom lines and their brands as well. So, okay. Welcome to this call. I hope I didn't fudge it up. <laughs> no, you got it. You got the name right and everything. So <laughs> that's <laughs> good. you're already a winner in my book. <laughs> so, Kay, can you tell us a little bit more about your business? I know who you serve, but, you know, how do you get in touch with these people? Or how do they get in touch with you? So I think a lot of businesses and what I found, you know, myself included as an entrepreneur for the past four years is you're always in constant evolution as a business owner, as, you know, as a person, as a CEO, or maybe the different products and services that you have, you realize that something's not quite right, or you want to expand into a different audience. And so that's where I come in. And that's how people find me is because they realize that the story that they need to tell to their audience so that they can actually move forward in that new direction. They want to take their business without losing momentum. They have to upgrade. And so that's where I come in. And I, because as you said, I live in Spain now, so I operate in both English and Spanish. And I found that across the board, whether I'm working with, you know, personal brands all the way up to, you know, some of my bigger clients have been Google and Standard and Poor's, there's always going to be a level of you need to be able to communicate effectively in any business setting. And you need to learn how to tell a story that just doesn't just engender trust, but also an action that needs to be taken, whether it's your client or your teammate or whatever. And so that's, that's where I come in. That's my jam. And it's, it's a very specific thing that you do and you help people with Did There's something in your life trigger this, or did you realize that there was a gap in the market that you had to fill in? What happened? So I think a combination of both of those two things you just said. So as you also said, I am from Los Angeles. I am originally Filipina American. So my parents immigrated from the Philippines to the States when, before I was born. And even growing up in a place as diverse as Los Angeles, I would always get that second follow-up question that we'll say non-European looking faces dread, <laughs> which is, where are you from? Mm -hmm. Question number two, no, where are you really from? <laughs> yeah. And I remember growing up, you know, the you know, the last thing that you want when you're a kid is to stick out and you just want to blend in. You don't, you hate that question, right? And it used to really bother me and I would you know, answer kind of sarcastically, well, I'm really from California, you know? <laughs> um, but I think that when you're a minority, a child of immigrants, you instinctively know that, you know, there's this bigger kind of wild, wider world that's out there and you realize that, you know, it doesn't get you that far to always shut the conversation down. And so I remember, I don't remember if it was an aha moment specifically, mm -hmm. but I decided that instead of kind of clenching my fist, I would extend my hand and just share who I was the next time somebody asked that question. And I just shared my story. And I just saw by the power of sharing who I was and where I came from, where my parents came from and kind of what my deal was that, you know, I was able to change one person's worldview. And that, I think that lesson stuck with me of the power of story on an individual level. And as, you know, I progressed in my travels and then eventually moved to Spain in 2010, you know, I started adding different chapters to that story. And so when it came time to, you know, finding a way to connect what I do naturally with helping other businesses, 
I just found a natural fit because I saw that there was a big gap in terms of how businesses were communicating. I think there was a, there was a transition right around that time of, you know, kind of leaving this sort of advertising, sell, sell, push, push, push to, uh, well, how do we engage them in conversation? How do we draw them in? And that was kind of the, the, the big shift that a lot of companies had to make was like, oh, it's not just as simple as throwing money at a, at an ad. It's how do I meet my customer where they are? How do I engage them and let them know that I care about them? And the best way to do that is through story. So that, so a combination of the two things that personally and professionally just came together in a great way. That's very cool. And you talked about, you know, helping that one person seeing a change and realizing that is something that you can help others with as well. Now, I always find a quicker, faster way of helping more people is to create a course because that way you're not personally investing your time in one person individually. So have you done that? I mean, have you taken this as a concept of and turned that into courses that people can go through at their own pace? Absolutely agree with you, Neil. I think there's a point in every solopreneur, you know, coach, consultant, strategist life where you realize that your schedule's full, but there's only one of you. <laughs> and you also want to reach more people, like you said. So I did launch my first course, Story School, last year. And it was life-changing for me just to realize, I think it's a completely different way of, of helping somebody else learn. Whereas one-on-one, you're kind of really fully engaged in that conversation with that person, helping them find their story. The beauty of working in a group course with, you know, sort of a, a group dynamic is that you're a facilitator and people still learn and still bring things to the table, but you're not the only one responsible for helping them find it. They actually either find it on their own or they interact with other group members because I pair them off with accountability partners. And it's just a really beautiful process. It's different, but it's also just as valuable. So I love, I love the course setting for sure. And it's something that I want to do again. We found that as well. I mean, when you build a community around the same problem, people are kind of willing to jump in and share their experiences, help other people out as well. Now, as you know, we have a community of product creators, of coaches, trainers, and you know, they do face challenges once in a while when it comes to selling what they have. Now, approaching it from more of a storytelling angle, what do you think is the biggest challenge? But what is the thing that people do wrong when they try and sell their courses and how can they fix it? So I think one of the things that a lot of people do, and this is just, you know, this isn't saying that people are necessarily copying on purpose, but I think that when we're creating something new and we're not quite secure in whether or not that course is going to work yet, we tend to be influenced a lot by other people and other things that we've seen. And we inevitably model more of, of what they do and that input rather than focusing on our own process and our own kind of unique spin on it. So I would say, one thing that I see is put on the horse blinders and really focus on celebrating what you uniquely bring to the table instead of kind of grasping for what other people are as models because you are unique, you are talented in what you do. And this could be on the woo woo side of things, but you are completely and utterly like one of a kind <laughs> in sure. the universe. So own that process. And, and then I think the second thing is forgetting to look back into the why of why you're creating this course. So I think that you know, another reason that people take on courses is because like me, they want to scale, they want to reach more people. And I think there, there's almost a tendency to focus too much on the end result without really trying to validate first why you're doing it and why you're doing this to serve other people. And so the natural, uh, the natural process of story when you're going back through like, why am I creating this is that's actually going to be what helps you sell the course because people want to know what sets you apart? Why is this worth my time and investment? You know, who's the person behind this course that's going to be, you know, guiding me through this, this process, whether it's, you know, marketing or products or, uh, you know, stories. And, and so connecting to that why ultimately is showing your, showing your potential student or, or customer or member that they're going to, they're going to be guided by somebody who's already walked that path sure. and and is able to help them get to where they want to be faster and and you can only do that by showing how you got there and and why you you decided to create it so those are so my in that your own story is really important because you know your own story kind of represents or the beginning of it represents where most of your audience is right now that's when you're trying to teach them what you know Exactly. You're teaching them what you know and what you, what's hard fought knowledge for you in some cases. And you're basically 
you know, giving them a behind the scenes look and, and taking everything that you've learned, even if you're just a couple of steps on the path. I think that's the other, to answer the original question that you said, I think a lot of people think, oh, my course has to be totally innovative and different, but it doesn't, you know, sometimes, you know, we go back through our own experiences as business owners and we can, we don't necessarily have to be, you know, 50 miles ahead of where our customer is. We just need to be a couple of steps ahead. And that couple of steps is a course. That's a, that's a process that you've proven that has worked for you. And now you're showing somebody how to do it. So. Absolutely. In fact, I've got a funny little story here because I know someone who teaches languages and once he had someone come up to him and say, Hey, I want to learn Mandarin. Do you teach Mandarin? He said, come back to me next week and I'll, I'll tell you basically I'm busy this week. So what he did was he registered himself into a Mandarin course and every Sunday he would go to that course, learn like the first unit himself and then teach that to the person next week. So a lot of the teaching and training comes down to just being, like you said, a few steps ahead of whom you're teaching and having the confidence to do so. Absolutely. That's great. a great story, by the way. <laughs> yeah, no, he, he really does that. It's amazing watching him, you know, being quite proficient now in 12 different languages or being able to teach at least. It's a, it's a pretty impressive thing. Now, let me ask you this as well, because it comes up quite often. So when you started creating your, your courses, were you able to get to your first thousand quickly or did it take you some time? Was it easy? Was it difficult? How was it like? <laughs> So the first time that I sold it, I was able to sell it out and I made 5K. And so I, I know that that was also because I spent a lot of time pre-validating it, getting, you know, I did a beta launch first. Sure. And so I had those people test it out. And then afterwards I opened it up to the rest of my list. And, and it was something that was one really cool to, you know, everybody talks about passive income is the dream, right? Passive income doesn't exist, by the way. <laughs> just letting you guys know it's really active. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the actual process of, you know, selling this course and filling it up and, and then seeing those little pings every time that sale came through was just really empowering for you the, as a first time course creator. And, and yeah, it was, it was a really great experience uh, from start to finish, both selling and, and launching the course and, and ending it. Yeah. I can imagine. And do you remember what price point that course was at? So I had it originally at, I had it at 397. Okay. Now it's at 597, I think, nice. and I'm probably going to raise that again <laughs> for the next yeah. round. <laughs> I think it's, it's a good way to also introduce scarcity and let people know that you're quite real about the numbers that you're putting out there, that if they do miss this now, they can still get it later, but it's going to be at a higher price. Exactly, exactly. And you know that after every round, it's going to be improved because you deliver better as a course provider. You have the proven experience of seeing that it's been validated and it's working for your students. So that is obviously, you know, it's not just raising for the sake of it. It's also your, you know, you're bringing more value every round. Absolutely. And I mean, what's your goal moving forward? Do you want to continue to grow and scale your course business? Or do you have other things you're doing at the moment as well that you want to grow? Yeah, definitely. So I am still doing one on one, but I loved the experience of, of launching Story School as my first course. And I will definitely be relaunching Story School in the future, as well as another program, uh, which I'm tentatively calling Master Your Message, which I'm currently beta testing, nice. which is basically taking the next step after Story School, because then afterwards people are like, cool, the course is over. I want to do something else with you. And, and you, you answer the call at the end of the day. <laughs> wow. Yeah, for sure. I think that I really like Master Your Message the, as a title itself as well, because I think it speaks to everyone who knows that they've got a great story to tell, great message, but it's just not strong enough at the moment. So I like the positioning there as well. Thank you. That's no, good. But let me ask you this question. Would I be right to assume that you are a digital nomad or close to I would say digital nomad is probably the closest description of me, but I only really go back and forth between two places. <laughs> Los <laughs> Angeles and Spain are already quite far away. <laughs> sure, that they are. I mean, and, you know, if you travel to conferences and such, there's a lot of moving around as well. For sure, yeah. for sure. But tell me a little bit about how your life has changed, you know, seeing that back when you were, uh, back when you were living in Los Angeles, now you're living in Madrid and you're running a more or less digital business, I guess. So how is life different compared to how it was before? I would say Los Angeles. Well, one, one of the things that's attractive about Europe is that you can walk everywhere <laughs> in a city with good public transportation. Um, it was something that was always fascinating to me. I just remember when I was younger, Spanish was something that I always wanted to learn. And so I found a way here. But on top of that, I think it's just the, you know, I, 
coming from Los Angeles, which is a place that's very, you know, very diverse, but also very, um, I can't think of the word in English. (laughs) (laughs) That out later. Um, You know, a place that's very spread out. Sure. That you don't necessarily get to see, you have to plan lunches and dinners with people ahead of time. You are in traffic jams constantly spending easily four to five hours of your day, you know, in a car. And that may be worth it for some people who want to live the dream of living in LA. But for me, it just was like, no, that's no, I don't want that. And moving to Spain was actually a way for me to kind of shake my routine up a bit. And then I met my husband my first year here. So who is Spanish? So I'll be here for a while. It's been eight years at the time of this recording that I've been living in Spain. And, and yeah, I would say that one of the things about living abroad or being a digital nomad is that you realize how important it is to have access to both of the places that you call home or the multiple places that you call home and have a way to sustain your life in that way. And one, and that was what was so attractive to me about entrepreneurship and being able to, you know, create a business that built, that is built around the ideal lifestyle that I want to have and, and allows me to serve people from a place of, my talents and whatever I can offer them in terms of connecting them to their audience with story. So yeah, it's been, it's been a really cool journey. And for now, Spain will be my home base. It's a, it's a good place. I have to say, and I, I like Madrid. I think it's a, I prefer that to Barcelona. It's a really nice city in my opinion. So. You're winning points in my book. Even, even with the Los Angeles comment, you're winning points in my book. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. But Hey, tell me this. So a lot of people who are listening in right now, they, probably have a course that they want to sell, but they just can't push themselves to do it. So can you give them an advice? Can you say something that will help them to fine tune the message and help get the course out there? Definitely. I think one of the reasons why I was able to sell out my first course is because I did a lot of listening. I did a lot of research beforehand. And, you know, I think whenever you're nervous about putting something out there, I I like to think of it almost like the visual of a flashlight, right? The flashlight can only point one direction. Mm -hmm. If you're only thinking of yourself, you're thinking of what if it's not good enough? What if I'm not ready? What if I'm, and it's so, it's very focused on you. But if you switch the flashlight the other direction, you focus on them, the people that you're trying to serve with this course, who you know ultimately need what you have to offer, who can actually benefit from whatever it is that you're putting out there. The only way for you to find out how you can help them is by asking them. And so from, you know, many different conversations, you know, interviews, uh, coffee chats with people who I knew would benefit from a course like this, my own clients, I was able to sort of gather a repository of just their language. It was almost like a language database for me of, what is what they're struggling with? How do they talk about their problems in their own terms? And that ultimately is what I, I think was the biggest selling point or the biggest advantage in helping me sell the course is because I was essentially raising up a mirror to their reality and reflecting it back to them, obviously from a place of, okay, I've heard you, I see you, and I've been on that path, I've been you, and this is what I know that I can help you with so that you can get to where you wanna be faster by speaking to them in their own language with the story that I shared around the course. So that would be my tip for you if you find that you're in your head about, you know, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm nervous about putting this out there, talk to people, talk to people and talk to enough people that, you know, you find a pattern in a common thread in their challenges and their obstacles and create something around that to help them solve it. And I think the language that you talked about is important too, because you really want to be speaking in their terms, terms that they can understand, they can relate to. And that also piques their interest in buying something from you for when the time is right. So the discovery phase is very useful to a process. I think a lot of people overlook that because it's kind of boring or they feel like I'm not taking action because I'm not creating or selling. But even before you can get to that, I think the discovery is very important. Definitely. That's good. Now, uh, a quick fire round because I've got a few questions to ask you. Don't think too much about these. Just say the first thing that comes to your mind. All right. What's your favorite book or what are you reading at the moment? So I am reading Crazy Rich Asians <laughs> you are? Okay. Um, because the movie has just come out and I really wanted to read the book behind the movie. But I would say that my favorite book is Start With Why by Simon Sinek. Okay. It, it was the first thing that really turned me on to this idea of story and this kind of driving force behind whatever your idea is or whatever business that you want to create. Sure. Okay. 
I haven't seen the movie yet, by the way, The Crazy Rich Asians. I should watch it. I, I haven't probably. yet either. <laughs> okay. Book's usually better anyway, so. Yeah. Uh, but tell me this, what's your, uh, what kind of music are you into? So it runs the gamut. Salsa, indie, uh, musicals. It's just whatever I'm feeling like in that moment. <laughs> and do you go to concerts or do you have any favorite bands? I would say my favorite band of the moment is Bandolero Chino. They're an Argentine band okay. and it's, they're just, I would love to see them. I would love to see them live. And I would say, man, I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> okay. I just, I'm thinking of my, you can cut that out later, but I was like, I'm thinking of my playlist. I'm like, what comes up most often right now? It's Bandolero Chino. I'm in a Bandolero okay. Chino phase. I'll check them out as well. That's good. Um, when you're traveling, do you prefer to go to the city, the beach, mountains, or something else? Mm, it depends. It depends. Okay. I would say mm, lately I've been craving beach and mountains because I want more nature and I live in a city. Okay. Well, that, that's fair enough. I completely understand. And I guess you can be forgiven to if you go to Barcelona for that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's good. And what's your favorite city that you'd love to travel to anytime you can get a chance? Mm, I would say London and Paris always. Yeah. I love both of those cities and Berlin has was one that really that really intrigued me and I, I, I loved more than I more than I thought I would. Yeah. Yeah, I like the kind of art and a little bit of a ghetto scene in Berlin as well. It's still, you know, not quite there uh, like London or Paris are, I guess. So yeah. yeah. Interesting place. Now, uh, if people want to learn more about you or get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? So the best way to do that is through my website, kfabella.com. And if anybody is looking for, you know, just an audit for their story, I have a free download that you can grab there. So just when you're putting together the story for your course, you just head to kfabella.com forward slash start. And it just guides you through the five ways that you can improve the story to make sure that it's, it's saying what you want to say about your course. Okay. I'll link to that as well underneath the video so people can check it out. But Kate, thank you so much for doing this call with us. I think it's been very, very useful. I hope, I really hope that people listen to this and realize that there are, you know, a, a story is a very crucial part of selling and I hope they work towards fixing that as well. So thank, thank you so you. much for having me on.